On this Debaco University video, we're going to go over how does hop latent viroid spread, which is important for any grower to understand when you're looking at prevention uh, and a way to combat a potential issue in your growing operation. So there's a lot of concern over hop latent viroid. Well, here we're going to learn about how does it go about spreading. So first off, a great presentation um, here. I took some screenshots from this uh, by Dr. Uh, Zamir Apunja. Uh, welcome to check out his presentation here at CanMed23, as well as others' uh, information provided in the description link. So how does hop latent viroid spread? Well, mechanical damage, such as trimming, um, the sap contact is actually what is causing that uh, viroid to be transmitted. So that results in the grower being the most common vector. Insect uh, vectors are possible, but at this time, they're not really well understood. So if you, a grower, are trimming uh, from one plant and move to another plant, you've kind of just inoculated or infected the next plant, sadly. Uh, also, uh, in addition to trimming the above portions of the plant, root contact, um, and this could be root contact physically with the roots or water carrying that um, from the roots of one plant to another. This is where the viroid load is actually very high um, and early on, as I'll talk about in a moment. Seeds, another potential uh, way or method of transmission of this hop latent viroid. So potential routes of transmission, as I said, about the water. Uh, it can go through the water, so flood and drain systems, DWCs, deep water cultures, clone trays, flood and drain, really any operation that recirculates water, this is of concern. It can also reside in the irrigation tubes, um, the growing substrate, as well as the roots. Um, all areas of uh, potential of transmission, this is why or how it can spread so quickly through an area. It's also a very stable viral aid, and it can survive in water for up to seven days, so about a week, and that can help speed its um, infection of many plants in a growing operation. Now, it is phloem trans transmitted, so not to get too much into the biology aspect, but entry into the phloem is what allows it to move up as well as down the plants. In contrast, xylem is mainly roots to shoots or bottom to top. Um, phloem can go basically any direction. Uh, phloem follows the sugars, and it does translocate through the entire plant, or at least hop latent viroid, via this route in about six weeks' time, so very quickly. An experiment provided here, some of the data, they made a stem cut, and they did an artificial transmission of hop latent viroid to exposed stem cuts, as we can see right here. The viroid was inoculated at the wound site. In two weeks post-inoculation, it could be detected already in the roots of the plant, as well as the upper um, stem portions of the plant. Four to six weeks uh, post-infection, the entire plant becomes infected. So it kind of does a little bit of this unique um, jumping ride. It doesn't just start in one point and just radiate out. It actually goes to specific portions of the plant. They've outlined that here, uh, where it was found in here's the points of inoculation, found the roots in two weeks, and youngs in four weeks, and then the rest of the plant in six weeks. So what was interesting about this path of infection is it is you know stem top uh, inoculated the roots were actually the first point where it reached detectable levels then other top growing tips and then the lower leaves or branches became positive for hop latent viroid in that order in that two um, to six week time frame so it's important we're looking at potentially taking samples roots may be a good area to sample uh, this kind of shows another visual. Uh, the virus travels down first to the roots, indicating that it is phloem transmitted, and then spreads to the apical meristem followed by uh, the full plant infection. So here's a point of infection. Two weeks later, right down to the roots, accumulates down there. Then after it accumulates down there, then it goes back and it kind of shows up at the very top of the plant. And then six weeks later, then it's well distributed amongst the entire plant. So keep that in mind. The flowering uh, can also increase the viroid load. The stress of flowering can increase the amount of viroid that's present in the plant. This shows the importance of testing a plant multiple times as early veg, it could be below detectable levels. You could have that viroid, it could be very low, not really stressed, not really proliferating. Testing in veg is still important, as if a positive is found in veg, that plant should be removed immediately. And, but just because it tested negative in early uh, veg, uh, following up with another test during flowering would be advised to ensure that that small, potential small viral load, then when it becomes much larger, be easier to find and identify, uh, would be worth a second test there. Now, as I said, water transmitted, which is again a little bit scary. Uh, this is in part how it can travel so fast through a growing operation. 
Plants do not e even have to come into direct contact with one another. It can spread infections via water transfer contact. Any recycling water is, uh, is at risk, but two common methods occur where the cloner tray transferred only on water. We could see here where there's a physical separation between these plants, but there's a water connection, and that allows that healthy plant to become infected from that unhealthy plant, and flood and drain growing as well. You can also see in the cloner where the virus was detected two weeks of exposure of healthy roots in a solution containing infected roots. Uh, there was no physical root contact, but clearly we could see that it is able to basically go through that water and take down healthy plants. Also on a tray where they're physically separated, water going between the two, that virus goes from one to the other. Also infected uh, mother plants. So since the viroid is systemic to the plant, cloning the plant will produce many infected offspring. So it's not advised you take cuttings or clippings from an infected mother plant. This is also why testing and retesting mother plants is so important. All cuttings pictured tested positive for hoplite viroid infection. So if you get a mother that's positive, you want to remove that mother and do not take any clones from that. You'll just be spreading the infection even faster. Now, seed transmission gets a little confusing um, here um, and showed that uh, when female plants are infected, this can increase the odds or the percentages of the seeds that are infected. Most of the hot plate and found is on the outside of the seed coat. 10 to 15% infection can still be found on the inside of the seeds. If the seedling, uh, typically cotyledon, um, has any physical damage, uh, the hot plate and can easily enter the plant from the seed coat. So be a prime example here that seedling's kind of coming out and unfurling. That seed coat might still be attached. You get a little physical abrasion. Well, if that hot plate virus is right in the, on the seed coat, it can easily now get into this very young plant. It's also present in dry flowers, and it's not just the super young plants. It can also be the fully mature and harvested uh, dry flower. 40% sampled from dispensaries did show positive for hot plate and viroid. This, uh, now this was, study was done in uh, California, I believe, but shows how widespread it actually is. It's also found in male flowers. So it's another reason for concern that just because only, you're only using it for breeding purposes, you don't want to have any male flowers or male plants that have the hot plate and viroid as well. Glove transmitted, so it survives on sap on gloves up to five days at room temperature, showing how very stable it is. So when you're discarding your gloves after trimming, discard them in a trash can and leave them there and get that out and removed from any part of the growing area. So that stable can survive for five days even at warm temperatures, which would be considered room temperature. Leaf transfer uh, can survive for four weeks, so be sure to clean and remove leaves that are being trimmed. This is why it's important for your gloves to be disposed of and physically removed, as well as leaves. Survival on dried leaves tested one, two, three, and four weeks later, four weeks is still getting positive there. So that just shows you the stability of hoplite and viroid and how easily it can transfer from material that growers might be not worried about or not thinking about. It can really do any harm to their operation. That root tissue, ever important root tissue, uh, it's very stable viroid, heating it to 70 degrees Celsius, which is about 158 degrees Fahrenheit for 30 minutes did not destroy the RNA. That RNA is kind of looped over itself. Very, very stable. Has a great longevity in the roots. Um, you know, that is just uh, speaks to the, you know, reason why this has probably become so prevalent um, in the, the uh, growing world right now, because it's so stable that it's able to transfer very easily. And once it gets kind of established, it's very hard to get rid of. Now those male flowers that I had mentioned, at this time there's no real evidence that hoplite variety can be present in the pollen, but it can be present in the male flower structure. Um, uh, it can be found in the male flowers as well as in the anthers. But unconfirmed in pollen and no evidence of transmission yet, not saying it doesn't happen, uh, but it's at least not right now apparently obvious that it does. Um, but again, another reason for concern. So even in breeding, if you're like, oh, I'm not going to grow that plant to, you know, for to produce flowers for a dried flower, I'm only breeding with it. Still, reason for concern. Still, reason to remove that plant from your operation. To hopefully, reduce the overall uh, viroid load.